Take note, everybody. You are listening to Music Is My Life, a podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and on this edition, we receive a guided tour of the musical life of Leo Flynn. You don't know who Leo Flynn is? Well, he's the brand manager of Vitamin String Quartet, which are part of the CMH label group. Now, since the turn of the century, the CMH label group have been all about taking popular music within any given genre and transforming it into bluegrass with their Pickin' On series, into lullabies with their Rockabye Baby series, or rock a Baby series, and into classical with the Vitamin String Quartet. Leo Flynn has worked on the latter two of these series, and later this month, the Vitamin String Quartet will release VSQ Performs the Music of Kanye West. You know, for most of the people I've spoken with, it's been a clear, okay, this is where your journey started. Uh, I can understand how that music would influence you. But yours is certainly more difficult to guess at uh you know you're working in music that the original genres span pop punk rap rock and then they're all done in classical style or lullaby so so yeah let's let's start at the start where was the first eureka moment you had where you you realized that music was was something that was important to you well i I think early on there are a couple big eureka moments. I I share the story, or rather my dad shares a story. Uh, he was a musician when he was younger and still a working musician when I was very little. What, what did he play? He was a bass player in, uh, in, in the Philly scene and, and bands and, and uh, you know some of the notable studios in Philly, part of the Philly sound. And um, he used to bring me, as a toddler, he used to bring me to his band rehearsals and sit me on the amp and uh, all the thumping apparently I, I got very excited about that and would bounce on the on the amp and uh, soak in all the all the good music making uh, so that I think that probably set the set the seeds very early on right so now did he did he play in any any notable recordings in the Philly sound I mean because there's so much good stuff coming out at that time we're talking like early to mid 70s or yeah, I think so. I, uh, I know Billy Harner specifically. He recorded with, mm-hmm. and he he kind of played in circles with uh, you know Todd Rundgren and his you know his band shared the stage with a lot of the greats that came through Philly. Um, so I think he was he's he's on the club scene here in Philly, and you know stayed very active and traveled a little bit here and there in his earlier days. And and you said that uh, you know he was working full time uh, as a musician when when you were young, but then he he switched over to something else. Yeah, when particularly when my brother and I got to little league age, and he was uh, still traveling on the weekends to go do a show or a wedding or something. He he uh, he got really tired of that. He wanted to be around home and uh, catch those games and have a more normal family life. So all the while being a musician, he was also a house painter trade he learned from his uncle. And right around that time, he just went into that full time. I think he was, you know, he probably between tours or gigs or whatever, he was painting houses and, you know, keeping it all together. And it just got to be, I assume, uh, you know, a big drag being away from family. And so, yeah, he made, he made a switch to, to just being at home. Right. And, and at what point did you pick up the, the bass is your instrument right bass yeah I started on bass yeah um so later i mean as a kid i had i had a piano lesson here or there and um i think my my dad may have even been a little cautious with like how <laughs> to how to uh, uh encourage or introduce music or music making to us as kids um i had a, I had a lot of interest in I was creative as a kid. I drew a lot. I, I liked to write poetry and, uh, you know, I, I did well in school and, um, I was active in sports. So I really had a very well-rounded childhood and music sort of came in fits and starts. But, uh, when I got to adolescent age, 
12 or 13. This is the early 90s grunge music hit. And um, me and a couple buddies uh, picked up instruments. I picked up my dad's bass and we decided we were going to be a band and we were going to write some great songs and learn Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. And that was the start of, uh, of my musical life. Nice. And, and you said that he, he, you know, treated it with caution, you know, whether to encourage you or how to encourage you. Was he somebody that when he switch, made the switch, was he, was he burnt out? Or did he look, how did he view the music industry or his role in it, aside from it just being something that took him away from his kids' Little League games? My dad is a really creative person and he had other creative interests. I know he had a, he had a, a life in a parallel universe as a photographer. Um, that was a great passion of his when he was younger as well. He had um, opportunities that he turned down there to go and pursue music. Um, and then also I think his, his trade work, the, the house painting is also a creative outlet for him. And, uh, you know, reshaping people's homes and you know, the color and interior design and, and the thought that goes into that. I think he, he uh, what he taught me as a kid, taught us, uh, his children as kids, or uh, the way he put it was that life is your real canvas, right? And you use all, you have all these different colors to paint with and uh, be open to that. Right, like your your life, you, you might live many lives in your one life, and and pursue different things. And um, I think he was more a proponent of not cutting yourself off from having maybe even conflicting interests. You know, don't you don't have to necessarily just choose one over the other, but find a way to to exercise all of your muscles and 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 passions. So I think he, I don't think there was any great. I did, I never sensed any bitterness or, uh, he just, he just, it was just the, the, the next step for him. And he went into it, you know, raising children, having a family. That's a, that's a creative act. And I think he, I think he wanted to, uh, embrace that as well. And when you would perform with this, uh, what, what did you call yourselves? Oh, it had many, <laughs> many incarnations, uh, some serious, some very silly, I think our I think our serious uh, first phase grunge phase I think we called ourselves Exit, <laughs> and then we we uh, started to uh, execute on our crazier influences of Infectious Grooves and Red Hot Chili Peppers and John Spencer Blues Expo Explosion and became at one point a, a power funk metal trio by the name of Hambrosian Smack. Wow. And uh, yeah, started started building up some serious bass chops. <laughs> That's awesome. So so w when your dad would come see Hambrosian Smack or Exit, uh, what what kind of pointers did he, he give you after? Or did he just did he say, that was great? Yeah, just encouragement. He really, he, he was just always there encouraging. And uh, I'll, I'll say he, he, consistently pointed me back towards the piano make sure you know what you're doing with respect to the piano um and that's something that has hung with me i'm not i'm not a pianist by any measure but uh i i i can voice things and i know what's going on there so he he wanted me to know what i was doing deeply musically and encouraged uh writing and arranging and uh producing um you know, maybe from his time, he could see there's a way to take a little more control of your destiny in certain creative situations uh, than simply just being a musician or a session guy. But um, there, there's all these other layers to investigate and maybe, maybe delve into, and 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 that can shape your your path too. So. And you really did kind of do that, you know, with, with where you're at now. But how, how did you get there? And when you were playing bass, was that ever a thought like, you know, maybe I will try and be a bassist full time? Or when, when you entered Berkeley, I, I, I believe you didn't start at Berkeley, though, did you? 
I did not start at Berkeley. I so let's see the the band thing continued through high school, and that was a lot of fun. But I had I had a uh, a rigorous academic track in high school. I went to a, a college prep school, and and that was uh, a more traditional. Like I was, among other things, I was focused on a traditional non-arts, if you will, traditional academic track um, and trying to figure out where that was going. But at the same time, very interested in music and the arts and, and being creative. Um, the band thing was, a, was huge for me. That was, you know, my, my life and world outside of school. And But as I went through high school, I got more and more interested in that writing and production part of it. I remember uh, Charles Mingus being a huge influence on me in high school where it went from, okay, here's this great bass player opening the door up to what a bass player could be as a band leader and a composer and a visionary and a madman, <laughs> you know, just a, a great creative genius. Uh, and my listening also started to open. I started to listen to classical music and find some of my favorites there and and look at music and composition beyond just what I knew from listening to records and being in bands. And it just seemed uh, this uh, fascinating world to dive into. Who, who was your, um, your guide through that? Or did you just discover it on your own? I think it was just scrapping it together from different experiences like I uh, you know I was always too busy with sports to play and to play in school bands but then you know one off term I did sit in uh, with the band and you know here we're playing um, some foray uh, pavon French impressionistic classical music and I, I didn't really have a lot of familiarity with classical music but that that like grabbed me um and was mesmerizing, uh, and, and from there I, I discovered Ravel, and uh, that that's some of my favorite music, uh, and that's where I started to get the feeling like I want to know, I want to pursue whatever it is that makes Mingus and Ravel and U2 and Radiohead all work in this same transcendent way. Like there's something common among all of these artists and uh, I want to I want to make things like this and I want to I want to understand how things like this are made what what is uh, ties them together and then I want to make that kind of stuff myself so I think it was just different experiences you know classical world rock world shows I was going to and just taking you know listening to records with my dad uh, mm -hmm. and friends and and just being really open minded and and finding finding fascinating things seemingly in every genre. Right, right. Yeah, well, tell me about those years and, you know, some of the performances you might have taken in and, you know, felt that uh, that energy, that, that, you know, the transcendent energy that you goes through all the music. Yeah, well, I mentioned U2. U2 was my first love. Uh, that was another eureka moment for me as a kid, was uh, traipsing through our family room and my sister who was a teenager at the time I, I think I may have been seven or eight uh, she always had MTV on and I was, I was uh, between my dad putting records on for me or my sister uh, constantly listening to MTV and I, I had Prince and Madonna and Bon Jovi uh, or the soundtrack to my part of the soundtrack to my childhood um, music always on but one day crossing through the family room and uh, U2, the video for U2's One came on and it's that that guitar riff and that Leslie sound and and Bono's smoky voice and uh, you know this imagery of these buffalo in slow motion running over the cliff. I was just going to ask if it was it was the good artsy one or the one where he's just in a bar. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the buffalo one, and I and I I remember I just stopped in my tracks and and was hypnotized by what I was hearing and seeing and feeling, and I was 
up until that point, I'd always been surrounded by music. It was a, it was a big thing in our house. It was a joyous thing, but it was, it just felt like another kind of part of life and family life. But that was the moment where, um, it felt very deep and personal to me as an individual. Something about that music was really getting, uh, getting to me in a deep way. Uh, so you two loom large and see, seeing those guys in concert was, was a big deal. Um, Right. They they really had at the pinnacle of their like commercial success, they were doing these crazy artistic things like changing their sound entirely and doing a video with a buffalo running. Yeah, I remember my my cousin who is older, I think I I think this was in the sixth grade, I was, uh he got to see the uh the zoo tv tour the the, the tour the, the tour of the octong baby album and i was ju- i was really just getting my wherewithal with music and my music and you too and i remember uh reading a, a write-up about the concert and thinking about my cousin had gone to see it and feeling this and for the first time, like this incredible jealousy, like, <laughs> you know, and they had the, the cars hanging over the stage and he was, you know, he's in this fly regalia. And I say about you too, it's, it's, it's the, the sacred and the profane, that mixture of, of the spiritual and the sensual. And for a Catholic school kid in adolescence, it's just, it was just irresistible. So, so you go and you're exploring this stuff in high school and then wh- where do you end up starting? Goucher College. Uh, just north of Baltimore in Maryland, which is a liberal arts school. And I, towards the end of high school, putting out applications, I really, I, I still, I was uh, so much of a, a of an academic um, and music was so much of a hobby and just a fun thing. I really didn't, I, at that time I wasn't ready to, you know, take the dive and go to music school and really like, you know, start investing <laughs> uh my my parents you know livelihood in it and and uh so well it's it's weird like i've thought about that is i've watched nieces and nephews choose colleges and it's just been like that is such an early age to know exactly what you want to do and i think it's too early yeah how can you how do you how can you uh, how do you understand the value of the education or really know how to make a good some people know some people know from early on but if uh, the system is 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 tough in that way the the system that we have uh if you could just let kids come out of high school i think go and work for a year or two and get a sense of things in the real world i i could have used that and in a way i got i ended up getting that like i i I did just need that because i there was inertia coming out of high school uh to go into a liberal arts setting and so i i spent a year at goucher college which was a really neat liberal arts school um a lot of intellectual types there and uh, some of my classmates from from school were there and um, and I, I really, I really did like it, but I became restless. Like the music, this music question kept burning hotter and hotter and, and I was feeling restless. And so I, halfway through my year there, I put in, I put in an application and sent in, uh, some audition tapes and uh, applied for, uh, one of the scholarships and, and I got in and I, and I, and I, uh, achieved a partial scholarship. And even then I was, I was still wrestling with it, but I, I remember looking at the acceptance letter and, and uh, the, the bit about the scholarship. And I was like, well, if these guys are willing to let me in and they're offering me a little bit of money to go up there, you know, I, I, I must have some business there. Let, let me, let me go and try it. So that's, that, that was my transition to Berkeley. What, what kind of feedback were your folks giving you? My dad thought it was going to be the greatest thing. You know, we had made a trip to Berkeley at some point and we walking through the buildings and the, the labs and the ensemble rooms. And he's like, this is, if you want to make music, you, this, you know, short of being in a band that already has something going. So he was, he was very encouraging and excited for me to go there. And I think, I think for my mom too, it was, um, all right, well, if you're going to do this, this sounds like the right way to do it. Right. So you get to Berkeley and what, what was your major? I went into contemporary writing and production. So you, you pretty much knew that this was the track you wanted. I mean, you, you basically indicated you kind of 
knew that deep down, but you didn't realize you knew, you know, in high school. Yeah, I, I couldn't see myself pursuing bass uh, full time. I, I had a sense I didn't I didn't want to I wasn't looking for a musician's life on the road and touring uh, like specifically if somehow my and I still feel this way if somehow my creative efforts you know put me there but I wasn't seeking that out necessarily I was I'm very interested in how things work and then you know mm -hmm. trying trying to create on my own so um, so it wasn't I don't, I don't think it was ever going to be bass and uh, interested in writing and production and and what attracted me to that too is it at least the way they described it, you know, to be able to write and arrange and produce for any situation, that sounded very interesting to me. Also different from the MP and E major, which I know a lot of folks have gone into who could could write and arrange and produce and they wanted to go and learn the studio. So for listeners, I should clarify that MP and E is music production and engineering. Correct, yeah. I was, I was still very interested on a fundamental level of really getting into the nuts and bolts of how music works and i just had the sense that you know you'll figure out the you'll figure out the <laughs> the 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 mixing you know the recording and the mixing and all that stuff but if you have a great piece of music everything everything is so much easier and makes sense right, so right. i was really interested in that so so the the transcendence comes first and then the mp and e sure because i mean we, you know, we all grew up recording stuff onto a little tape deck or a Tascam 4 track, and you can feel, the magic is there. You know, you lay down that second track, and there's that interplay between the two parts. It doesn't matter if it's 80% hiss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, th that thing will take off uh, in that form. Right. And in, in that media, it doesn't need, I, you know, some of my favorite bands, that's their records sound like that. Uh, guided by voices, you know, it's, the, it's all there, you know, how, how, uh, what kind of resolution you want to experience it with is like a question for later. So you go through and you, you get your degree and is the CMH label group right after college? And so a few years later, yeah, there's some kicking around. So let's see, I was, what were the kicking around years? What were you doing? Yeah. 2000 to 2003 were my Berkeley years, graduated 03. And I went back home to Jersey for half a year or so. Figuring out, like, okay, now what do I do with this degree? Um, you know, I didn't have a plan. Uh, post a lot of a lot of folks that you talk to at Berkeley have a specific. I'm going to Nashville. I'm going to New York. I'm going to LA. I'm going to get in, involved in film scoring, and uh, I had no plan. But uh, after a while, I realized I should try to figure something. I was at home working in a restaurant, and then again at night writing, playing, just staying creative. And I decided to go to LA almost on a whim. I had found a sublet and uh, saved up some of my restaurant money and figured I'll just, I'll get there and get a job and figure it out and and just throw, throw my hat over the wall. Pretty early on through the Berkeley LA office, I landed an internship with a composer named Yuval Ron. I think he, he, he went to Berkeley as well, but he was, he's from Israel. Uh, he had, he's in a fascinating career. He has a, a film and TV composing and production side of his life, and then uh, the Yuval Ron ensemble that he, he's the band leader and the, the main writer and uh, soloist for this group that's uh, very eclectic, uh, Middle Eastern styles and uh, has a whole message about bringing different cultures together, particularly, you know, with respect to, to Middle Eastern cultures and tensions there. There's kind of a mission and a message. It's a very positive one. M makes wonderful music with his band, and then he's composing and operating all this from his home and an attached studio. And so he he needed help just with all of these different things. And it was it was really eye opening to, you know, this is again. Uh, a, many new styles of music for me, uh, experiencing those, uh, kind of diving into film and TV, seeing how a creative person can build these different businesses for himself and become, you know, again, shaping his own destiny and path is very, very fascinating. 
uh, while I was there, he was working on the score to a short film that was a musical called West Bank Story, which ended up a year or two later winning the Academy Award for Best Short Film. It was a lot of fun to be involved in that project. Uh, it, it's, it was very much a, a colorful Hollywood-born project. Uh, it was a short musical. It was a riff on West Side Story. Instead of the Sharks and the Jets, though, you had uh, this uh, conflict uh, out in the, in the Middle East, uh, these two fast food restaurants across the street from each other, the Hummus Hut and the Kosher King, battling it out uh, in the streets through song and dance. And, uh, you know, uh, very funny, a lot of colorful, uh, like, voice character actors into the studio and these wonderful singers and, uh, you know, seeing the seeing how the director operates with a composer and this whole, you know, this whole orchestrated production um, was really eye-opening for me. The internship ended at a certain point and West Bank's story was done and, and he referred me then to uh, another great TV composer by the name of Dean Grinsfelder, LA-based guy who uh, worked on a lot of specials for the Discovery Channel and he, he scored films as well and and I, I worked with him, I guess it was like 2005. I worked with him for about a year. And what were you doing? Uh, assisting him uh, just generally in the studio. Uh, but then I, I did a lot of music editing. We, we, we were working on shows that what were what they called wall-to-wall -wall music. Discovery Channel specials that we worked on, like Alien Planet, you may have heard of. Um, yeah. There was a special called The Science of Star Wars. I departed... Dean's studio sometime late 2005, 2006, and, you know, still knocking around and filling in the, the gaps with restaurant work and keeping myself afloat. And in 2006, uh, you know, looking for gigs, I, I think I, I happened upon a, a job opening at CMH label group for uh, like a sales support position. And it was a job at a record company. I, I don't think I had seen that yet or not one that seemed available to me or possible for me. Right, right. After 2000, it, it seems to be a yeah. tricky proposition. <laughs> fewer and fewer of those for sure. Yeah, so this stuck out like a sore thumb as an opportunity. And I went online and I researched the company and here they're doing what is this blue a bluegrass tribute to red hot chili peppers uh, <laughs> pick my kiss you know and I'm on their website I'm looking at the artwork and it's one of the chilies has a tattoo on their upper arm I don't I don't know exactly what the meaning of it is but it looks like an asterisk uh, and here they had here on the on the bluegrass tribute they had put that symbol like painted on a barn so I love it just hit this uh, creativity just really hit me about this company. So I was really excited to go on an interview and, and I did. And as soon as I walked in, I felt very at home, uh, in a way, in a way, even different from being in the studio with the composer. Like there was a, there was a broader perspective on music there, you know, here, here is an outfit that is making its own product, like deciding what it makes figuring out how to do it, making it and putting it out into the world. Whereas, you know, with a composer, you know, you're kind of working, at least the experience I had had up to that point in film and TV, you're on a gig, you're on a job. The show needs music and it has parameters and you're, you're going to go and meet those demands. Um, and here it was like, nope, we're going to, we kind of do, what, <laughs> you know, whatever we're, we're interested in doing. Uh, of course, you know, the market the market ultimately decides, but I love that feeling. So 2006, I, I interviewed and started up there and in the sales department running reports, uh, learning Excel and email etiquette and organizational behavior and marketing and copywriting. So how did you get to be where you are now, where you're specifically uh, associated with Vitamin String Quartet? So uh, a year or two after getting there, I took over running our release schedule and album production and you know keeping everything on track and seeing the music come in and giving notes and artwork getting done every you know 
we at that at that when I got to CMH, we were we were making like two to three hundred records a year. All kinds of crazy tribute ideas uh, going and um, trying to just mash together different genres and. Uh, it was there was a lot of music making, so uh, I I assumed a role of overseeing like our release schedule, and then that that uh, also, in another year or two later, maybe around two thousand eight or nine, that transitioned into me more full time overseeing Vitamin String Quartet as a series and further as a brand. The album series had actually started in ninety nine, well before I got there. And now, it, is is it really a quartet? I mean, it's not just the same four people, right? It's not. No, it's it's a series, and we we have a we have a pool of players uh, that we work with, and it's it's an ever evolving cast. Different projects we might elect for a certain combination of players. You know, this this project might require a little different bend uh, than this other one here, and so we rotate through through a small pool of players but there, we're always adding to it as well right and have you ever been on the recorded side no not myself on with regards to VSQ no right but you you've done some production for VSQ just overseeing production actually uh, i've myself uh, arranged and performed and produced for uh, another CMH series called Rockabye Baby, right? Which are lullaby records that we make. Those were a huge hit in my family. Yeah, my son. Uh, I initially wanted to get him so familiar with all the Rockabye Baby versions that, and like keep the original versions from him for a few years until. And so one day he'd just be like, "What? What is this?" <laughs> you know. But <laughs> yeah. but I couldn't help but turn him on to the regular versions. Oh, that's fun. And you have children? I do. Yeah, I have two kids now. Are they nuts about the Rockabye Baby series? We we put it on uh, here and there, but as you can imagine, I myself <laughs> get, I'm pretty, can be pretty burned out on it. Right. So right. I, I come, I'm coming out of the studio to put more of it on. Um, but we, yeah, we, we've we've listened to our share of it, and uh, it was a big help. Like I'm. I, I know it is for a lot of parents uh, for sleepy time and nap time and bedtime. What of the Rockabye Baby series did you produce? I produced our Queen, Kanye West, Van Halen, Doors, uh, which comes out on vinyl this week for Record Store Day. And uh, Queen, Queen was my first one. And uh, that was... I mean, I'm still on that journey too. Like, uh, you know, I, I work at the label. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the label team, uh, but it's also created this opportunity for me to continue making music, arranging and producing, and to do it with the team that is like a family to me. And you know, we 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 push to make those records for them to be classics, right? We want we want folks to be listening to the. Rockabye Baby albums in 30, 40, 50 years. I want them to, to hold up and not just be, you know, some, you know, in service of some fad, but to try to make classic, classic renditions. What do you see as the audiences for these things? People who already like these artists. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, what we've seen is it's a very popular gift item. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have a friend who's uh, about to have a baby and, you know they love the flaming lips. So, what cooler, thoughtful gift could you could you go for than Rockabye Baby lullaby renditions of the Flaming Lips on vinyl? It's like so cool for them, and it you know connects them to their their identity pre-child, and now okay, now I, now I'm a parent, but it can still be cool, and this can be you know a shared experience. And ultimately, it's the fan of the group who's having a child. And right, and I, I could have used Vitamin String Quartet when I was in college because the only way to get a radio show was if you at first did a classical music show, and I did that, and I, I would get in trouble for just playing the same things all the time because my scope was rather limited to like Toccata El Fugue and... Um, Star Wars and things like that. <laughs> yeah, as as best we can tell, those college students are our most uh, maybe our biggest fans, most engaged fans. Uh, 
they lean on it heavily for study time and focus time. You know, uh, it, it, it's a speaking about worlds. It's a familiar, you know, it's a familiar one that of their favorite song or band, but it's recast in a way instrumentally and, and in a way that could be maybe meditative or at least or focusing, or, you know, not distracting. And uh, we, yeah, we see a ton of feedback about how, how much the, the records are used for study time and work time. How about the musicians? Does does everybody you know, always wholeheartedly embrace these artists that you choose? Or, I mean, it's it's an interesting ask, you know, to be good at what you do in your field and then play music that originated way outside that field. Well, some players aren't not interested in it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that we've had the experience of taking someone like cold from out of the classical world who never did anything with pop music. And, you know, our players are folks that move back and forth between the two worlds and have a wide spectrum. And so they're, they're already there. Like they get it. They, they, you know, they probably do lots of gigs already where they're, you know, they're asked to play pop or rock songs. And yeah, they, they kind of instinctively get it. But I, I would also say to, to any of these musicians, like this is, this is a very interesting challenge for you. You know, there's a, a lot of the classical repertoire, you know, how that works with the instrument is already figured out. And it's, there's just a lot already established. And when you make this switch over to the pop and rock world and things are maybe simpler, but, but there's also more space left in the music and you need to create a groove or a pocket, um, these l longer overarching sounds and strokes. It's actually, it can be very hard for the players. They're, you know, they're used to executing notes. Notes fill the, often fill the music in the, in the classical repertoire. In pop music, a lot, a lot of it is empty space. And, you have to, and you're figuring out how to play around that and, and create these kind of larger than life moments where there's a lot of air and breath in them. So we, you know, so let's say we're doing a Coldplay tune and you have this uh, repeating riff that's very simple, uh, but it, it can actually expose a player. They can have a really hard time keeping that rhythm steady and the tone right where it needs to be and to get the thing to float because there's actually less to do you have, you know, you hear the adage about it's it's always hardest to play softly, right? It's not the pounding that's the hard part. It's the control and the discipline in playing softly or playing slowly or playing simply. And so, you know, classical musicians can come into uh, the room with us, uh, you know, you know, years and years of high intensity training and music, and they're met with this simple riff, and it's it can it can really trip one up. And it's interesting, the latest release, or uh, it comes out on the 24th, right? The Kanye West. VSQ performs Kanye West is out, uh, I think, this weekend is Record Store Day. Um, uh, April 22nd, Saturday, Record Store Day. And then uh, the following Friday, it will be April 28th, we'll, ha we'll have the wider release for the digital album. Right. So that's an interesting case because... You know, he's somebody who's mostly known for rapping. I mean, he did have that one album, uh, 808s and Heartbreaks, where he's singing on more of. And and it's interesting to put his rhythms, his vocal rhythms, to a melody. I mean, I mean, he, the way he raps is slightly melodic, or it's actually very melodic, but... It is. Tell me about how that process goes with something like hip hop, where where the lead is uh, not doing more drawn out notes. You know, they're more da, 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 you know percussive. Yeah, maybe percussive. I think. Well, um, hip hop uh, that's true generally in the verses, but then hip hop loves a big melodic chorus, right? A big big melodic hook. So you. So you're never too far off from uh, what we'll call a familiar melodic moment for the instrumentalists. Um, and I think Kanye, especially, there is so much melodic intent in his rapping. Uh, I mean, I went through this working on the, the lullaby rendition of Kanye, where you can, he you can hear in his rapping, even though if he's not... He's not uh, 
hitting the pitches and he doesn't want to because then he'd just be recycling you know old melodic ideas because he, he wants to stay urgent and immediate and more plain spoken but he is calling upon like very familiar melodic forms and you know blues licks things that we hear have heard for ages in pop and rock music and little figures that are going to be familiar to all of us uh the that intent is there he's calling on that stuff from his you know his somewhere deep subconsciously his psyche he's pulling on all that stuff that he's heard and he's using it to express something uh new in a new way uh but the melodic foundation is still there so even where it's even where it's very percussive and maybe monotone uh, longer than would be a traditional melody, it's still, dramatically, it still has to find a place to go pitch-wise, even if it's not, you know, if, even if we're not talking about, like, perfectly tuned scalar notes. Uh, dramatically speaking, there's there's got to be some motion there. So it's just finding that and letting the instrument do it. It's something new for the instrument and the instrumentalist to explore. What kind of thought goes into which songs you'll select. Looking at the uh, rundown, there's Famous from Life of Pablo is on there. Was it a conscious decision like, oh, we need something, at least one thing from the most current album? Or is it just, if you could explain what, what the thinking is when you are picking out the tracks and are there selections that you try out but just don't sound as right for it? Yeah, we, there's a balance. There's there's a number of considerations there. I mean, we we are still in a lot of respects tributing an artist and it's it's for the fan of that artist and we try to if we can create a a whole portrait of the artist so that might mean trying to do something from each of their albums or uh, not just focusing well sometimes we do just focus on one album and that's that's the moment that we want to um, seize upon but if we're looking at an artist we'll try to we'll try to pull from different albums and eras uh, there are other pieces where like yeah that feels that feels new and exciting to us um you know i'm thinking of some of kanye's uh, later tracks like new slaves which is you know minimalistic and the original minimalistic and harsh but really compelling and that's something that we want to try on strings we think that could we think that could be exciting that could make for interesting string music and then sometimes those things don't work out. I mean, we, very rarely have we shelved a track completely, but it it's happened. You know, sometimes that's just to do with deadlines and timeline. You know, we we love to keep trying, and you know, maybe some things we can revisit. But for the most part, we ha we have a good sense of what could work well going into it. We we spoke a bit about transcendence in music, and when when was the last time you had that feeling of transcendence? Whether it be you know something you've worked on with CMH, or just a show you've been out to recently, or something. I I get that routinely um, with VSQ and watching watching us take music apart and bring bringing it back together and bringing it to life. And we've started doing these live stream performances uh, with VSQ. You know, we're not we're not a touring entity. Uh, we we do go out once in a while for like a special engagement, but we love the idea. We, we started to do this of just getting the musicians together in a room to, you know, maybe we're working on some charts or rehearsing or just workshopping some different players and uh, putting that up live, at least for, you know, for a little while, for, for a live stream audience online and making a performance event out of it. And we've done that now a couple times recently. I think uh, that was a transcendent moment musically and in terms of the business and uh, the team that we have at the label uh, working on VSQ and all the players that we've been working with for years. And it was this moment where, you know, we're really doing things on our own terms putting musicians in a room, you know, these fascinating arrangements and wonderful musicians and creating it. It's live. It's online. There's a, there are people from all over the world watching it and enjoying it and giving us real-time feedback. And, you know, it's 
this is just sort of this is an experimental part of the business and we're doing it because it's just music it reconnects you with what you know what music is all about which is getting together and making some noise and you know everyone getting their spirit lifted there you have it folks the musical life of leo flynn of the cmh label group it's proof that you need to listen to the song in your heart and follow it where it takes you And just because you don't get yourself a job playing music doesn't mean you can't get a job making music. That's what Leo Flynn does every day and gets to have his spirit lifted pretty regularly by the musical folks he works with. Well, thank you for tuning in. Visit us at online.berkeley.edu slash take note. And I'll talk to you again soon.